Hello, my name is Mary Lurson. I'm the executive director of the NAMM Foundation, and I'm today's host for Talking at Music Education. We are a podcast of the NAMM Foundation, emphasizing music education and the journey of a life in music and the opportunity to share with so many people their stories and their aspirations and their inspirations. So I'm just delighted we are here today in Nashville in, the, in July, whatever the date is, July 13. We are at Summer NAM in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm just delighted to welcome Phil Madeira to Talking at Music Education. Welcome, Phil. Well, thank you, Mary. I'm delighted, delighted to be and here. And it is really hard for those of you who don't know who Phil is, it's really hard for me to describe him in less than the 20-minute intro. But let me uh, just state that he is a remarkably experienced professional in the music industry, a songwriter, producer, a musician of multiple instruments, a singer, um, played with remarkable bands. Tell us who you've played with. Let's. Well, most most notable is uh, is Emmylou Harris, uh, who I still work with, and just come off the road with. Yeah, right? but uh, but uh, you know, as a recording artist, uh, as a session player, gosh, man, it's. It's a long list. Garth El Brooks, Toby Elvis Keith, Costello, Dave El Matthews, Vince Gill, Boss Gags, Patty Crazy. Griffin. I'm filling in the blanks for you here. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's yeah. hard. It's hard to. Uh, it's hard to even. Amy remember. Amy Grant, Toby Keith, Buddy Miller, Julie Miller, the Neville Neville Brothers, Sixpence None, the Richer, <laughs> Mavis Staples, one of my all-time. Oh Vanessa yeah. Williams, who grew up in my county, by the way, her How parents cool. were music educators. Did you know that? How cool is that? Remember music teachers, so, uh, Solomon Burke, Keb Mo, who's also a good a buddy of Nams, and yeah. so uh, a big, big career. I'm very. Very thankful, very humble. For, how, for uh, almost 40 years or about 40 oh yeah, years? Yeah, well, 41. I started in 1976 with a guitar player in the Christian market named Phil Kagey, who, was, uh, who f remains acclaimed. And uh, that's where I got my start. Was this, you know, that's how every, everyone gets their start, by some person of, of note, I guess, hearing them and saying, in Phil's case, he, he met me and he said, I think we'll be in a band together one day. That was 1973. And what did you play? In, what, what instrument were you playing then? For him, I was playing piano and, uh, and keyboard. And, okay, uh, and we know you play electric guitar. Started as a drummer. As a drummer. I was a drummer in high junior high and high school. And you know those drum departments, since you're a music, music education oriented person, the drum the drum department's always where the shenanigans are. And I was a mischief maker. And, uh, but was fortunate enough to be in a great school, in Barrington High School in Barrington, Rhode Island, where, where music education was a big deal. We had, we had uh, so I was in our stage band where we got to be you loose were and set. play You're drums. Trap, and yeah. I was in stage band, symphonic band, concert band. Uh, and then also, uh, I did spend some time in marching band. I really didn't enjoy marching band. It just wrecked your weekends. Right. But all this to say, and then I was also in, in chorus. So all my activities in high school really uh, were training me in a way that I had no idea I was going to be a professional musician. See, see we're, we're digging up. I'm, I'm looking at you, and I'm saying, maybe we're digging up things you haven't thought about for a while. Is that true? Oh maybe? yeah, I, I mean, I mean, the, I mean the fact that here you are with this really, really rich career, and yet kind of everything you it all got started when you were thirteen and fourteen. Right? That's exactly right, and only because it was there. Well, you know, you my know? my mother would tell you that I came out of the womb drumming, you know, and, <laughs> and so drums were my passion. <laughs> still are. Right. Still, I right. still love the drums, and what happened to me was. You know, I was just a kid who wanted to play drums. So school band was the opportunity to do that. In eighth grade, uh, I think I started in school band. And then um, had a gift. It was notable. Uh, I was very undisciplined. And then when I got to college, I wasn't a music major. I was not a choral theory type guy, you know. And they didn't offer in 1970, fall of 1970, Unless you went to a place like Berkeley, which I, I might have gone there. I should have gone there. I was just an art major at a little college in Indiana. But 
that love of music at that point drove me to pick up guitar by myself. I started writing songs. Songs moved me away from the drums to something performable. And, um, but I had no idea that I would have a life in professional music. Mm-hmm. We, we, back then, you didn't have foundations that said, you know, you can, ha- you can make a living in pop music. Or it you just, could come to the NAMM show and experience a, a wealth yeah. of uh, opportunity and, Nothing. and maybe model something. Yeah. So I am grateful that we had a school system, and I, and I know that's a problem now. I know that music education is not... A priority in our country, and I think it ought to be. It's not as a universal and as, as acceptable as we would hope for, and that's essential is to our work right now. Yeah. You know, we know that where it's strong and the tradition has started as it did in your childhood. Yeah. Something was there for you. I remember all my band right. teachers, Mr. Something, Lichtenstein and Mr. Waite. And, and, <laughs> you know, and 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 I too had that experience, and I grew up in the middle of nowhere in rural America. But that was available to me. Right. So, um, so we we see pockets of we see pockets of great great flourishing opportunity for kids, and then we see just desolation. And it's our our goal is to make this awareness known, and that we all we have to fill in these gaps for kids because oh, yeah. every kid that comes up through the line, you didn't know when you were starting that this would be your life, but had you not had that sort of continuum of experience. You couldn't have made those next steps, right? Well, I did have, you know, I had a dream that I thought was ridiculous. So it was an unspoken thing. I had parents who were really wonderful. Uh, My mom is actually still with us at 96, great piano player. I, I did have parents who understood that they needed to pay attention to the fact that their son was invested emotionally into the arts and so when those doors started opening, they did not discourage that. You know, uh, when all of a sudden the opportunity to play with this fellow, Phil Kagi, came up, my parents found it really exciting. Now, the woman that I was engaged to, her parents, they were, quite they were not excited. excited about it. How did yeah. that go, by the way? <laughs> well, 25 years of marriage and then we divorced. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of that but, story. Uh, you but, know, no, but honestly, okay. honestly okay. Uh, no, but my daughters are both... Uh, both musicians, one of them is semi-pro, and the other one just, they both play, but, the, you know, they did not have, they didn't have a, a strong music educational program, but they had a parent who does it. Right. And now they wanted yeah. only so much help from me. Dad, show me this chord on the guitar. Right. But largely, they are self-taught musicians, yeah. you know. So interesting, and thank you for sharing all of that. And sure, thank you I, for letting sorry me. Sorry if I went to the uh, too close to the personal there but that's part of the story too oh that's what my ex-wife and I are great friends good and, uh, and yeah. I probably some great great material came out of that oh yeah <laughs> right, absolutely right? you're a songwriter <laughs> after all um so um when having these chats with artists as yourself established uh artists performers this background is always really important for us to know that yeah that uh, it's almost like an, an accident of nature occurred that there was a great music pro- program, right? And it, it did give oh, yeah. you really good so- uh, bass. But the other side is you, you, you're you established. You've had a remarkable career. You just got off the ro- road with um, Amy Lou Harris. So the question is, what are you working on now? Well, I actually I mean, have a, I, I've got a solo record that's piano-oriented. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like if... Um, Oh gosh! If Randy Newman and Mose Allison and Dr. John and and Ray Charles all got together and and wrote songs, it's kind of like that. It's just piano, bass, and drums with a little bit of guitar and horns, and it's the record's actually about where I grew up. It's about growing up in Rhode Island. Name of the record's Providence. It comes out, I believe, February twenty third. And the style of the music is. Well, all it's, these it, artists you just mentioned, that's quite... Yeah, a, it's very much in that kind of New Orleans, okay. uh, uh, Ramsey Lewis, okay. kind of like a mix yeah. of that type yeah. stuff. It's as close to jazz as I can get without really, I'm, I, you know, I'm, it's like fake jazz. So how did you get the piano chops together? That Just I had a piano in my house. My mom was, con- my mother was, my mother was my first piano teacher which really made me disinterested in piano, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, I had the same experience, actually. So yeah. then they got me another piano teacher, Mrs. Worcester. Mrs. Worcester, if you're alive out there, thank you. Anyway, 
she saw the potential. None of us knew, you know, that I'd be a musician. I just wanted to play drums. But my parents were insistent that I had this gift. So when I took piano lessons from Mrs. Worcester, I had a, a good enough ear that I'd figure out what she was playing, you know, at a very elementary level. And I'd go in and play it. But I wasn't learning to read it. And um, at some point, it became frustrating to me, and I quit. And Mrs. Worcester called my mother, and she wept. She said, look, this guy is supposed to be doing this. And my mother said, well, as, 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 and my mom made the right decision. She just said, well, his heart's not into this. I, we can't make him do this. And, uh, but all these years later, here I am with a piano record. But it was a bass. It was a bass. You know, and, it was and, a and bass. And performance, too, doing yeah. those little recitals or doing the band concerts. All these things are very important to get you acclimated to how do you feel about the fact that you're in front of, you know, now last week, actually even this week, uh, you know, this week we played on Stephen Colbert. So how many millions of people I'm, am I in front of? Well, I'm not even thinking about it. You know, but these little steps... Get you get you acclimated. Do you are you a person who's who enjoys this, which I do, or are you a person who this is scary for? So let me ask you the um, I quit the piano question. Okay. Um, because almost every person that I interact with that tells me about their piano journey, they almost end the story by saying, "And I wish my parents had made me continue." <laughs> Well, I don't have that wish because... <laughs> but you continued in a lot of other ways, right? Well, the thing yeah. is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm known as a multi-instrumentalist. I'm, I'm certainly not known as any kind of amazing keyboard player. Oh, I mean, I, B3... But good enough to make a solo album. <laughs> well, and, and good enough to be on a lot of platinum right. records, but mainly as a multi-instrumentalist, Main, mainly as someone who can bring a bunch of guitars, bring a B3, bring, you know have enough chops to play pop music. Uh, when I hear friends like uh, John Schofield or John Medeski, great keyboard player, who I know through my uh, friendship with, with uh, John Schofield, when I hear someone like that, you know, that massive mastery of an instrument, I don't consider myself a, mastery of, a master of the instrument. I consider myself a really well-rounded person who ultimately knows how to express himself with a song, and I'll write that song, and I'll find these chords that I might not be able to say, well, you know, this is... You don't is, know exactly what, I, what you call them in the progression. Not exactly sure. Right. But, but, um, but it still fits, and it sounds beautiful. Well, yeah, and I'm, in, I'm really in that Americana music world, which, which, which bridges a few traditions, you know, bridges blues and old, old kind of country, bluegrass, just rootsy music. Ultimately, what I am is a roots musician. Now, if mom had, if they had insisted that I keep playing, because I was probably in about fifth or sixth grade when I stopped, and had they insisted, maybe I never would have done anything with it. Maybe I would like, no. Yeah, I don't want that's, to there's a lesson it. to that as well. So I'm really grateful. I, I accept my journey as how it is unfolding. I do believe. I do believe in uh, some sense of purpose uh, at, without being at all preachy. I do believe in, in, in I guess, may, I, I don't know if destiny is the right word, but definitely I believe every person is created and that every person actually has something in them to be mined. And so... Uh, so with that in mind, then we go back to we go back to your reason for being here, and that and and mine too. It's like okay, as a parent, let's even have it at that microscopic level. Just as a parent of two daughters, do I believe my daughters are here on this earth for a reason beyond just living, breathing, all the other functions, and then dying, or do I believe they're here with a purpose? Well, if I believe they're here with a purpose, then it's up to me to be listening and to be mindful and to say to my daughter, Maddie, when she was, I think when she was five, she wanted a guitar. It's like, you know, she was a lefty, okay? She was one of these. So I called Dan Blom, my luthier. 
I said, Dan, if I buy Maddie a little Yamaha guitar, a little, you know, juvenile size guitar, can you set it up for a left-hander? He said, well, I can, but she'll be limited if I do that. I said, well, how so? He said, well, she'll never be able to just be someplace and borrow someone's guitar. I said, just leave it right-handed. She'll figure it out, Ah, which she did. She's a real accomplished player. So all that to say, you know, do we believe in our kids? Do we believe that that there are aspirations to to achieve uh, that might bring peace to someone or might, uh, you know, when you think about, then you really, then you really look out and you say, well, who has really given something to the world through music? And in my, my paradigm is going to be folk music and rock and roll. And so I look at someone like Bob Dylan and I say, well, Bob Dylan really directed a lot of people towards, you know, questioning just the way things are. Uh, and then I look at someone like Bono from U2, who's the same sort of character, who is saying, yeah, I, I, I know I'm a rock star, so how do I feed that person 5,000 miles away? And uh, So if for no other reason, maybe music in a child's, uh, in the seed, you know, seed form in a child that can blossom, maybe we are creating another one of those... Oh, I think ambassadors. I think it's not a maybe. I think we are. Oh, absolutely. I think learning music really creates a better person over over a lifetime. You know, I think the and it's interesting that you know that's a pretty broad and probably not unsubstantiatable statement makes a better person. But we know the pieces of what makes a better person through research, music, music training. Um, is telling us all these all these composites, you know. Well, and then it's cognitive enforcements. It's the emotion, the ability to to have more emotional transparencies. You know, self esteem and being part of a team when you're in a band and the compromise well, of the and band. Why and why do you and, have? You know, why you are know, humans even you know. predisposed to create? You know, now there's a interesting question. You know, there's a scientific well, we, question. We're going to need a longer podcast. Right. So and, but it's a, and it's a spiritual question, too. Right. So yeah. so then you're kind of like, uh, you know, why, like when I travel with Emmy Lou, I bring a pad of watercolor paper that's, you know, postcard sized. And I bring a set of watercolor paints. And I try, I try every three days, if not more frequently, to paint something. To you know, now the TV might be on, but I don't want to be just glued to it, you know. And uh, but I'll paint something, and you know why? Why do we do these things? Well, we're we're creatives, you know, and we all have these things that some people think are necessary, and those are the people that will say, yes, we need to fund our schools, and then the other people are thinking. It's just a painting. We need to fund it in our schools. That's that's the point. Yeah. That's the point. I so. took your point from you. We need to fund yeah. it in our schools. And research is also showing us that we are wired for it. Oh, yeah. So if the if the potential is just innate in the wiring and we don't have the pathway to realize it, you know, we're, 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 short, we're short circuiting the opportunity for our kids. Right. So... Um, with this remarkable career that you're still that you're having, right? yeah, I'm I mean it's delighted. Just, it's still so. the engines are running on every cylinder. Just off the road with Emily Harris, working on a solo album. What's in it called? Providence. Yeah, coming Phil out. Madeira, Providence coming out in just a few weeks. February twenty third. Oh, so by the early. 18th. Yeah, I'm trying to market it. I'm actually trying to be smart with this one. Okay, early and then eighteen. Emmy's band, of which I'm a member, uh, we she named us Red Dirt Boys back ten years ago when we started playing with her. I called her about two years ago and said, "The four of us are going to make a record. We want to call it Red Dirt Boys. Can we have your blessing?" And she said, only if I can sing on it. Oh, my goodness. I know. <laughs> Drat. But anyway, so, so we've, we are just about finished with that. And then there's a lot that's involved with that. Now we have to go out and perform this stuff. Now we have to, you know, we have to get it booked. We have to market. 
uh, so there's a lot that goes on. You the know, music business. We always laugh. Right. You, you know, we always laugh. Like yesterday on our way back from New York, from playing our last show uh, with Emmy Lou, uh, the air went out in the bus. Of course, as soon as we, you know, hit when, Tennessee. When you hit 92, it, yeah. yeah, outside. And so right. now the air was out. And, you know, we, when those sorts of things happen, we always say live in the dream. Because everyone outside of our business just sees it as so lofty and blissful. And I always tell people, uh, I'm not being paid for that, excuse me, that 45 minutes or that 75 minutes to be on a stage. That's not what I'm paid for. I'm paid for the other 23 hours and 15 minutes that is, you know, being on a bus or lugging your gear, and showing or, up on time and playing in tune and having, rehearsing, ha- having all a that. positive attitude and support, supporting yeah. your teammates and yeah, all that right? stuff. Yeah, the real. But business. I wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah, no. you know, at this time in your career, um, I guess the question is, what if you could rank them? What ranks highest? Your kind of personal fulfillment. You know, we all kind of know what hits those buttons. You know, we just. Or is it is there still a real part of the work about stretching your own boundary, or is it a combination of both? Well, I, I honestly think that personal f- fulfillment does have a lot to do with uh, kind of removing yourself from an aspiration or a dream, uh, and saying, "All right, you know, how does one become a better father, a better partner?" Uh, a better friend, and so at the end at the end of the day, uh, I've got plenty of CDs around that people will maybe remember. Oh yeah, remember that guy? He played on this stuff. But I really want to be remembered as a great friend, as a great partner, as a great uh, dad more than anything. And uh, but they do feed each other. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the reason Emmy Lou has chosen the band that's with her right now is because we, first of all, the four of us adore each other. We are four of the greatest friends ever, and that's rare to have on the road. Mm -hmm. And we're also gentlemen to her. We adore her. We'll, you know, we do not take, none of of us feels like we deserve to be where we are. And I think that- Humility. I'm sorry? Humility. Yeah, there's a sense of entitlement that none of us has. Genuine humility. Because in in, in a town like Nashville, Tennessee, I guarantee you, you're going to find a better version of me, a better version of Will Kimbrough, a better ver- version of Brian Owings, and a better version of Chris Donahue. But you might miss certain chemistry, you know, and you mm-hmm. might miss certain... Uh, vir- being a virtuoso is not the road... I, I don't see that as a road to happiness for me. Mm-hmm. I want to be good at what I do. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I want to be the best at an instrument. I just want to be... I, I want to be the best person I can be for you at the moment I'm with you, you know, and uh, and you'll remember that maybe better than if I was some kind of astounding musician that was like, oh, hey, Mary. Yeah. So anyway, you know. Right. But I think at the same time, I I I sense that I would feel I am feeling really good about both. <laughs> Yeah, uh, our time together. Plus, it's your your record of accomplishment. Oh, I, and, I'm really and, happy. And about a person's that. record of accomplishment in music is really cumulative, right? I mean, it's, absolutely. It's, and you know, every night that you are out on stage, it's a new night. Your and, call and, to a whole nother level of expectation. And, right? and I will say that and, every night there's a certain solo I take on a certain song. And every night I'm thinking about that solo. I'm thinking about that solo all day. I want it to be a better solo. I want to, I want to quote Thelonious Monk or somebody. <laughs> but the most important thing to me is that, guess what, Mary? There's a guy named Ricky who drives our bus who got us to that gig. You know, there's a woman named Emmy Lou who invited me to be a part of that. There's someone named Buddy Miller before that who said, hey, I want you to play in my band, who Emmy might not have heard of me if it hadn't been for Buddy, and so on. And the chain keeps going back to my parents saying, oh, 
He wants to get drums. They're going to be so loud. But what can we do? We need to let him get the drums. It goes back. You, you, no one gets here by themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, we've all worked with people who think that somehow they got there alone. I mean, big stars. Every once in a while, you'll meet a big star like that, and you're thinking, yeah, I don't care that I met him and right. don't care to see him again. Yeah. You know? I think what you've shared with us today, especially for the young people that are also in our audience for the podcast who are college music students and younger people that have these aspirations for their lives in music, uh, you've said an awful lot today about that. Oh. You know, I think the the concept of being true to yourself, um, all parts of yourself, but inherent in music is this this ever present challenge to be better, right? True. You think about that solo all day. You said, "Isn't that you funny?" Know, you know, I'm thinking I, about it right now. I mean, there <laughs> because we're inspired to go to that next step of being being you know, juicier with their creativity or the next version of it, you know. Yeah. And I guess that's what the essence of my question is between this this combination of the true personal fulfillment. And I think part of that is that we're constantly challenged. There's well, no, I mean, we have, you know, we're, we're comfortable in the environment of the people that, that we are lucky to work with, but then gnawing away at us is what we want to do musically. And that's always a push a bit. There's you know. a place of, can I share an anecdote? Sure. Okay, there, so there's a place of relaxing in who you are, if that's possible, and almost uh, like almost a place of unknowing your dreams. Uh, uh, and I, I'll just tell this little story. When my daughter Kate turned 21, she's 27 now, when she turned 21, she came to me and she said, Dad, she was almost in tears. She said, I haven't done anything with my life. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told her a story. And I said, well, when I was in college, when I was in art school, uh, I was asked to design a record cover. And so I thought, well, I'm a musician. I write songs. I'll just make my own record cover. Now, I didn't have a recording to put into it. So the cool thing was is that this is 1974. So I made, when I did the credits, I thought, well, who would I want on drums? Well, I want Russ Kunkel on the drums. Who would I want on bass? Well, Lee Sklar. Who would I want on keyboards? Michael Omardian. How about pedal steel? Al Perkins. And I said, now, Kate, here's the interesting thing. I was your age when I did that. I said, you know what's weird? I said, all these many years later, I've played with every single one of those guys. She's like, wow. So now, about six months later, I'm in the worst position you could possibly be in. I'm actually uh, short selling my home. This is 2008. Now, for some people, that'd be a heartbreak. I'm not cut out that way. I'm not wired to think that money has made me. So I'm okay with it. But it's still not the greatest achievement of my life. So I'm, now I'm packing up my stuff, you know, getting ready to move into an apartment. And I find my old portfolio from college. Now, both my daughters, both Kate and Maddie, are there when this happens. And I find this record cover. And I pull it out of the sleeve. And I go, oh, wow, girls, remember that story? And they were like, yeah. I turn it over. I had completely forgotten that on my background vocals. Who do you think I'd put? Emmy Lou Harris. <laughs> Well, I, and even now I, I choke up a, a little bit because it, it, it shows me that something was in my heart, something was in my mind that I didn't remember was there. And, and I have to, you know, however a person believes, you know, some, some people put it in, in faith in very uh, almost structured religious ways, and I'm all for it. However you, however you want to think about it, there is something in your heart. There's something in your mind, and you can't possibly know it all because it's like this giant computer, right? But ever since that day, I have said, in fact, it's, it, it's even in the lyric of one of the songs in the new record, but I always say pay attention to your dreams uh, because society wants you to get on the conveyor belt and just, look, pl please don't make any noise. Just do this task and 
get your mortgage and get married, have the kids, do the thing, and leave some legacy of what behind. And so I always say that, pay attention to your dreams because they're important. Well, I think we need to call this podcast episode, Pay Attention to Your Dreams. Sounds good to me. And I can't thank you enough for all that you shared with us. I've been here with Phil, the philosopher Madeira, (laughs) Phil Madeira, multi-award-winning, a multi-instrumentalist, coming out with an album in early 2018 called Providence. On this episode of Talking Up Music Education, a podcast of the NAM Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much, Mary.